Hey guys, happy Easter weekend. We've been praying for you and we're so thankful that you decided to join us. Uh, the traditional greeting on Easter weekend for hundreds of years is one person says he is risen, because he is, and the response, he is risen indeed. So let's do that. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And I wanna start off this weekend, uh, our topic with a question, it's, it's not a light question, but it's an important one. Have you ever been betrayed? Have you ever been betrayed before? Someone deceived you, uh, wounded you, took something from you and you didn't know about it? Like how did it make you feel when you were deeply betrayed? Uh, how did you respond in the future? What did you do in the moment? So I, you know, like most people, we've all, most of us have been betrayed very deeply. I remember back in uh, college, I went through a, a, over a year long depression after being betrayed. I, it was like I woke up every single day. Uh, I, first of all, I felt so blindsided. I felt so foolish for not seeing it coming. And then the pain just wouldn't go away. And I was like, every day I'd wake up, there's this dark cloud around me of depression. And throughout my day, it's like slogging through darkness and sadness and going to bed, the cloud was with me. And yeah, it's, it's really hard when you've been deeply betrayed. And so why is that an important question for us today? Because we're talking about the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And the gospel is so many things. The gospel is the story of our human hopelessness. You and I were sinners without hope. And God has two sides of his character, his love for us, which he completely loves us but he's also just, no, nobody gets away with anything. So God solved that in the gospel, the good news, by entering this world in the form of Jesus Christ, living the perfect life, everything you could do right, never doing one thing wrong, Jesus did. He allowed himself to be arrested, betrayed, crucified, paying for our sins. He was dead for three days and he rose again from the dead. And he was seen by hundreds of witnesses over the course of like 40 days. Uh, those witnesses gave their lives knowing that he is alive. Jesus ascended, he's at the right hand of God and one of these days, we're gonna see him again. He's returning to this world. That is the gospel, the good news about Jesus. The gospel is all those things, but it's also the story of deep betrayal. Jesus knew he was about to be betrayed. He could have stopped his betrayal, but he didn't. He let himself be betrayed. Like who would do that? If you could stop a betrayal, you would stop it. Why did he let himself, why did Jesus allow himself to be betrayed? That's our topic today. And so at the end of our service, we're gonna hold spontaneous baptisms at our in-person campuses. And in Jesus' day, every baptism was a spontaneous baptism. There were no classes, no registrations. You simply showed up at a service, typically an outdoor service. You heard a message. God touched your heart. And the speaker said, if you're going to show the world you are following the Lord, you're following Jesus Christ, come down in this water, be baptized. You with your clothes, clambered down in the water and were baptized. And so we're going to give you that opportunity at the end of this service. We have clothes for you. We have towels and bags. We have water for you. And our, our hope and our prayer for you is that God is touching some of your hearts right now because you have not been baptized since you became a Christian or God is moving your hearts. God is calling you to baptism, surrender to him. Would you do that this weekend? So let's go ahead and pray. God, I pray as we study the gospel, the good news about the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus, the witnesses that saw him and you are alive. May you help us to unpack the betrayal side. Help us to see what you experienced why in the world you allowed yourself to be betrayed and that you would call people to salvation, call people to be baptized, to show the world they are now followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we give you all the honor and the glory and the praise as the one who is resurrected and alive right now in Jesus' name, in your name, amen. So today we'll study the story of when Jesus' betrayal went public in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, this story appears in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, and so it's a very important story because of that. Not every story appears in all four Gospels. You say, what's an example of a story that doesn't appear in all four Gospels? Christmas. 
Christmas, which is hugely important, does not appear in all four Gospels, but this story of betrayal in the garden does. And so we're going to look at that four, we're going to look at all four Gospels, four different parts in a different order, Mark, John, Luke, Matthew. And God designed the Bible to be studied like a puzzle. You grab one part over here, one piece of the puzzle over there, you assemble it together to see the whole picture. We'll do that today. First of all, looking at the story of his betrayal. And we'll step back and look at the concept of betrayal. Like how could he do that? How could he let himself, when he could have stopped it, been betrayed? How could he do that? So before we start, I better share a bit about the betrayer himself, the man named Judas. Who was Judas? So Judas, uh, that's his Hebrew name, uh, that's his Greek name, but in Hebrew, you'd call him Judah or Jude. That's his Hebrew name. Judas was a Jew, one of the 12 hand-picked apostles of Jesus. He was Jesus' friend who lived three and a half years with Jesus, ministering, traveling, speaking. He was so trusted, he became the treasurer of the disciples. He kept the bag of money, and dude was stealing from Jesus and the apostles and the poor, stealing from them. He was a fake, a spiritual fraud. He had everyone fooled except for Jesus. And he was the one who made a contract to betray Jesus to the chief priest and elders and scribes. He sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver, which is 200 bucks worth of money for so little. That's Jesus' betrayer, Judas. Now, let's picture the moment. Jesus is 12 hours from his death. It's three in the morning. He'll die at three in the afternoon. He's in a garden outside praying. It's an olive grove. It's dark. It's quiet. 11 remaining apostles are sleeping. They've tried to pray for like three hours, but keep falling asleep. Jesus hears a noise, some footsteps in the distance. It's Judas with a number of the mob coming to arrest him. And he's in the process of waking up the 11 apostles. We'll pick up part one of the story in the gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 14. Mark 14 verse 43 says this, And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, uh, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now his betrayer, He's being betrayed, had given them a signal saying, whomever I kiss, it's going to be in the dark. I'll point out the right person. He is the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him and said to him, rabbi, rabbi, teacher, teacher, and kissed him. Yeah, Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. He pretended he cared. He is a liar, a manipulator. If it happened to you, you'd say, what a scumbag. And yet, you might have had this happen to you before. Somebody ever betray you, and in the act of betraying, they pretend right up to the event how much they love you, they're for you, they care for you. That's exactly what's going on. He's not a very smart betrayer either. He's with an entire mob of people. Where are these people from? He betrayed Jesus with a kiss. That's part one of the story. Part two is in John, John 18. In John 18, Jesus has a conversation with a mob that arrives with these torches and weapons and something incredible happens, almost like a force push, but it's a voice push. Uh, and notice the, the word he is in italics here. John 18, verse four. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. He's in italics. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am, he's in italics, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now, I'll teach you a bit about Bible translation. Every Bible translation in the world, our translations into English, take the original Hebrew in the Old Testament and Greek in the New, and they add words to the translation, which are implied, but not actually there in the original languages. And some translations tell you which words they add. This translation has the word he in italics, because he is not there. What Jesus actually said was, who are you seeking? Jesus, I am. And I picture a sound, whoop, 
<laughs> Everybody flying. Imagine a whole mob of people. Just, whoo, echoes flying back onto their backs. It's incredible. Why is this hugely important? Because I am is one of the names for God. In the Old Testament, Exodus chapter three, God reveals one of his names. He says, I am that I am. I am Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, or Yahweh, or Jehovah. That is the name of God, which means I am. What, what is Jesus doing? He says, who are you seeking? Jesus, that's his human name. I am. Whom? He reveals, he is God in human form. I bet they calmed it right down nicely at that moment. Part two of the story is in John. Part three is in Luke now, Luke 22. Luke 22. Now Luke's a doctor. He's a medical physician. And so in the gospel of Luke, you're going to find more biological details and medical details than all the other gospels. And it makes sense that the doctor, Dr. Luke, would point out a medical healing in this moment. This is in Luke 22, verse 49. When those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? So at least some of the disciples were armed with swords and they are vested in protecting Jesus. And one guy doesn't wait, verse 50. And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Now, in the John account of the God, this gospel story, the attacker's name is Peter. That's Simon Peter. Uh, the servant, his name is Malchus. And Peter wasn't trying to cut his ear off. He's trying to split his head open. As he goes down onto his head, Malchus ducks and his right ear comes clean off. And Jesus reaches down, picks up his ear, puts it back on him. And so you, you can relate to Peter. Like if somebody attacks you, that's one thing. They attack someone you love. You're coursing with adrenaline. You'll do everything to protect the ones you love. That was Peter. Don't miss this. How did Jesus respond when he's being betrayed? He was calm. He loved the mob. He had compassion for Malchus. And he healed one of his attackers. That's who the real God is. That's who Jesus is. Now, let's close out the story in Matthew, part four of the story. Matthew 26. In Matthew 26, Jesus asks his disciples a question, and then there's this ending horrible fact that was another gut punch for Jesus. It says in Matthew 26, verse 53, he asks his disciples, or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? He asks his disciples, guys, do you think I'm not totally in charge here? I'm God in human form. And I could pray for 12 legions of angels. A Roman legion in Jesus' day was 6,000 soldiers. 72,000 angels he could summon right then. And uh, he said, guys, I don't need your help. I'm still in charge, though I'm letting this happen. And then he says, verse 54, how then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? He says, this is fulfilling prophecy after prophecy in the Old Testament. And I know for me, this is totally true as well. So I'll, I'll never forget being a 19-year-old Stanford sophomore. I was back at the Kansas City area, started going to church. And I was not a Christian, though I thought I was. So I was baptized as a baby. Great decision. My parents' decision, I wasn't even part of it. But I called myself a Christian, and I wasn't. Isn't that the way for so many of us? Got baptized, family went, not really real for us. Maybe that's you today. It's the call for God is saying it's time for you to make Jesus real for you and be baptized, show the world. Well, it was the prophecies that got me. Prophecies like Genesis 22, uh, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53. If you are not a believer, I am so glad you're here, but I beg you, check those out. God used those prophecies fulfilled by Jesus to move me as a Stanford sophomore to surrender everything to Jesus. He was fulfilling prophecies. And then... A gut punch of a verse, verse 56. Verse 56 says this, but all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled and all the disciples forsook him and fled. Yeah, these are the guys that swore, these, you know, Peter was one, these losers may leave you, I will never leave you. I'll never betray you. I'll never deny you. 
his best friends in his great, greatest moment of suffering all left. You ever been there? We feel like you're down and everybody walks away from you. That's the story of Jesus' betrayal. Now, let's talk about the concept of betrayal. Like how in the world, why would Jesus allow himself? Because I would have stopped it. If I could see a betrayal coming, I'd be tempted to stop it if it was my power, if I knew about it. So would you. Why did Jesus not stop it? And so I've been praying about this. Uh, God moved me to talk about three thoughts, three reasons, there's many reasons, but three of the reasons Jesus allowed himself to be betrayed to teach us, inspire us, reveal what the Holy Spirit does inside of Christians. Here's our first thought today. Our first thought, Jesus was betrayed to understand us. He allowed himself to be betrayed to really understand us. Does anybody in the world really understand you? Maybe you're like my wife and I. So we have a grace group and I have a number of other friends uh, at Grace and our pastoral team who we've shared life with and we've shared the last 10%, last 2% and we feel like they understand us. Maybe you got a good counselor, a Christian counselor who knows you and understands you. Maybe you've met somebody who's gone through a trial like you have and they understand you like nobody else. So I was talking to, it was a younger widow in our church. She lost her husband and still had kids at home. And it's a smaller segment of the widows or widowers. And uh, she was just talking about her passion she has when she hears about other widows with kids at home, that she understands their situation differently and better than other people. Like they can relate, but not really understand like she can. Do you have someone who understands what you've been through, what you felt, what you're going through now? Jesus does understand. It's part of the good news of the gospel. Hebrews 4 verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Here's part of the gospel, the good news about Jesus. God who created us came into this world to experience life as one of us. And because of that, he understands our weaknesses. He knows what it's like to be totally fatigued, worn out, on the brink of burnout. He understands hunger and poverty and rejection and loneliness and loss and opposition and hopelessness and betrayal. Jesus was tempted in every area, just like us, yet without sin. What is a temptation? It's the thought of sin. Temptation is not sin, but it's the thought that you could sin in your actions, in your words, in your attitude, going against Almighty God. And in every case, Jesus did not sin, lived the perfect life. And it goes on to say in that verse, because of his experience, he understands us. He can sympathize with us. The word sympathize in Greek means literally to feel that hardship with us, to suffer with us in our trials. And if you've ever been betrayed before, if one of your friends betrayed you, a business partner, somebody in the church world betrayed you, your spouse betrayed you, a family member. Jesus knows what it's like to have those closest to him. Lie to him, deceive him, and betray him. He understands. So I thought of a second reason. Why in the world would Jesus allow us to be betrayed? Yes, to understand us and sympathize with us. The second one is to teach us. To teach us. Jesus was betrayed to teach us, to teach us how to respond when we're betrayed. So think back to a time when either you were betrayed and hurt deeply or someone you care about was betrayed and hurt deeply. In that moment, in that betrayal, um, how'd you feel? What'd you want to see happen? How did it affect you on an ongoing ba basis after the betrayal? Now, if you're like me, I had a wide range of very human slash sinful responses. <laughs> Naturally speaking, I want to respond these ways. On the one hand, when I'm betrayed, there's the, I don't ever want to see them again. I don't want to hear about them. I don't want someone to bring their name up in my presence. Such a normal, natural, human 
not like God response. The other extreme is not like no information. I want total information. And really what I want to see them do is hurt like I hurt. Hurt like the one I care about hurts. And both responses are very human and normal and natural and not of God. Because when Jesus was betrayed, how did he respond? He showed us to respond by serving people and blessing them. You know, I've never thought naturally, oh, how can I serve the one who betrayed me? What can I do just to pour out blessings upon? That's not on my radar. That's who Jesus is. He healed Malchus's ear. He washed the feet of Judas. He prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them. That foot washing story shows you who Jesus is and he teaches us how to respond to betrayal in our lives. So I taught this message, I think it's four weeks ago now. We had a series called Love One Another and I taught through John 13, Jesus getting on his hands and his knees and washing the disciples' feet. And if you missed that message, please, please go listen to it again from four weeks ago, week one of Love One Another. It's on our YouTube page, it's on our website. I encourage you to watch it because I act it out. Jesus, the night before he died, got on his hands and knees and washed the disciples' feet, including his betrayer, Judas. Can you imagine serving your betrayer before you're betrayed, knowing what's about to happen? Jesus said this in John chapter 13, verse 14. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. And 11 of those guys were true followers of the Lord, followers of Jesus Christ, washing one another's feet. What happens in the local church is why you need a church family to serve one another, love one another, show honor to one another, help each other grow. That's what we do to support one another in a local church. But one of the guys was a fake, Judas Iscariot. And he didn't like do what we would want to do. He didn't try to get revenge. He didn't get down there and he had his toes, like break each toe. He served him, he loved him, and he showed you and I how to respond when we're betrayed. So, you gotta write these verses down. These verses rocked my world years ago. Matthew 5, 44 and 45. Take a picture of this and look them up. Romans 12, 19 to 21. Matthew 5, Romans 12. Shows us how Jesus responds when he's betrayed. What the Holy Spirit is up to inside of us when we're betrayed. How God calls his followers to respond when we are betrayed. The Romans 12 passage uh, talks about you know, like serving your enemies, not responding with evil for evil, even up to the point of feeding and giving drinks to your enemies. So I'll never forget, I was a single guy in a singles group where this guy in our singles group hated my guts. Uh, I couldn't believe it. You know, my mom was as shocked as you are right now. So someone would hate my guts. I had no idea how to deal with it. I wanted to respond with like hating him back. I came across Romans 12, which says to love your enemy, do good to them and feed and give them drinks. So I went down, I was a slave to this guy's opinion of me. I went down to the grocery store. I kid you not. It says feed and give drinks. I bought a bunch of groceries, bought a bunch of drinks, brought him to his house. He opened the door to his apartment. I walked in a slave to his opinions. I walked out free. I kid you not. Jesus calls us to serve and bless those who don't love, like us and hate us, curse us. That Matthew 5 passage, years ago, Kathy and I were deeply wounded by uh, a couple. We, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't let it go. I'd, so many times I'd forgiven them. Oh, God, I forgive them. I, I set them free based on the gift of Christ. And I'd hear their name again and get re-angered. And I had no idea what to do. I was a slave to my bitterness, to what happened. I was betrayed. My wife was betrayed. My whole family was betrayed. And so Matthew 5, Jesus says, love your enemies. Do good to those who curse you. Bless those who despitefully use you. Pray for those. And so I started praying for those two individuals for God to bless them. Every day was like poison out of my mouth. Dear God, bless. I hated praying for God to bless them, give them life and favor and joy and success and money. And this person hurt me, hurt me, hurt me, hurt us. And a couple, three months later, I started praying it. I was set free. The Holy Spirit set me free. Jesus was betrayed to teach us 
how he in the Holy Spirit is helping us to respond to our greatest wounds. Are you, if you're a follower of Jesus, are you doing that? Are you following the Holy Spirit? Now, we talked about why was Jesus betrayed? Well, to understand us, he's experienced it, to teach us. And a third reason, he's betrayed to reconcile us through his death and resurrection, to reconcile us. So I'm not sure if you're tempted like I am. When I read a story, I typically picture myself, I identify with the hero of the story. Uh, you know, like, I'm not saying that's right. In fact, you know, David and Goliath, I'm picturing what it would be like to be David, right? You got the Good Samaritan story. What would it be like to be the guy that actually helps? The Good Samaritan. And in this story, it's Jesus. What's it like to be betrayed to respond really well? Uh, and I think to myself, when I'm, when I'm thinking about Jesus being betrayed, I'm thinking, how could Judas, Jude, Judah, whatever you want to call him, how could he think this is a good idea? Jesus created him. He exists because of Jesus. And Jesus was kind to him and provided for him every single day. And he sold Jesus out for 200 bucks of pleasure. That's it. Here's the deal. Every time you sin or I sin, we are Judas. We're often identifying with the wrong guy in the story. Because you know what sin is? Sin is going against God's will, God's word, God's heart. Every time you and I, in our mind, our attitude, or actions, look at God's word and says, nope, don't agree, don't want it. We think the Holy Spirit who prompts us to do something, say, nope, not gonna do it. We say, God, I don't care what your will is. I want my will to be done. You and I, guess what? We're channeling our inner Judas. We are the betrayers. It's why Jesus came. It makes the gospel so much more amazing. Here is Jesus coming to this world and he's washing Judas' feet. He's dying for Judah's sins. He died for my sins. It is amazing that Jesus died for us, was buried and rose again to set us free and to make us reconciled like it never happened. Like totally reconciled. Kathy and I, uh, we had this couple we know that several years ago, we weren't sure they were married. <laughs> we we're pretty sure on the way to divorce. At each other's throats, not kind, not for each other. Jesus has reconciled each one of them to himself, her to himself, him to himself. And in that reconciliation, he's made their marriage one. They're doing things and saying things that my wife and I drive away like, can you believe what's going on? This is reconciliation. They are praying for each other. They are for each other. They desire to serve each other. They are humble in arguments with each other. They laugh with each other. They are on the same team with each other. All that because they've been reconciled to God. It's like, what happened to the past? It's like it's not, it not happened. It's just having no impact on today, which is what Jesus did when he died for us. You and I, if we channel our inner Judases, our inner betrayers to God Almighty, he died to totally reconcile us. And so Colossians 1 talks about. This is so cool. Colossians 1 verse 21 says, And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. Every person before you receive Jesus as Christ as Savior, you're an alien from God, an enemy of God both in your mind, every thought against God, and your works, works that are against the Holy Spirit, against what God says. And those are the people, you and me, the former Judases, that Jesus died for to reconcile. And what kind of reconciliation does his death and resurrection offer? Shocking total reconciliation. Verse 22, reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you, here's how God views you if you know Christ as Savior, holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. What's that mean? When you receive Jesus Christ as Savior, though you were an enemy of God in your mind and in your works, he forgives you and cleans you and makes you holy. We're being sanctified, set apart for God. He makes you blameless, no more blame. No matter what was in your past, it was paid for. Above reproach, no history following you around. That is the reconciliation Jesus Christ offers you and me. And why in the world would Jesus die for our sins? Why would he allow himself to be reconciled with us? If you're a Christian, 
Is this moving you? Is the gospel moving you in, in new ways, in fresh, deeper ways? He was, uh, he was betrayed to understand you. You think no one understands me. Jesus understands you. It's why he says in Hebrews to come boldly in prayer to the God who knows what it's like to live like one of us in weakness and temptation. He has felt what we feel and we come boldly to his throne to find grace to help in time of need. He was rejected and betrayed to teach us, to show us a model of how we bless those who hate our guts, how we serve those who don't like us and don't agree with us, how we put ourselves in a place, a posture of showing the love and humility of God to those who don't deserve it. We don't do that because they deserve it. We do it because that's who God is. That's the gospel. That's the good news of Christ. And he was betrayed to reconcile us. Us, the former Judases, who deserve no reconciliation, enemies in our mind, alienated from the life of God. Now, if you're not a believer, this is your moment. Now, this is the most important moment of your life right now. This is it. I'll never forget being 19. I happened to be in Blue Springs at a Wednesday night Bible study. It was probably about nine o'clock at night when somebody offered this chance to me that I'm offering to you. He said, can I pray for you? And he said, every head bowed, every eye closed. Let's, fact, let's do that. If you're able, would you bow your head and close your eyes right now? And then he said, is there anybody here that would like me to pray for you to know Jesus Christ as Savior? And that day, my, my hand felt like a thousand pounds. I wanted to ask for prayer. Finally, my will broke and I raised my hand and he prayed something for me that I'm gonna pray for you. As your heads are bowed, as your eyes closed, Jesus, would you move in every person hearing this right now? May your Holy Spirit give them the gift of faith, the gift of surrender, and the gift of receiving Jesus Christ as their Lord, which means leader, you in charge of their life, and Savior, confessing their sins, asking you to save them. God, please move in people's lives. Okay, our heads are still bowed, our eyes are still closed for just a moment. If you'd like to receive Jesus Christ, you can surrender to him. God hears you in your mind. He reads your thoughts all the time. Just pray something like this. Pray, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, I pray, I pray that you'd save me. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me for my sins in my mind and in my works that have separated me from you, for being your enemy. And thank you, Jesus, for coming to this world on a rescue mission because you are just and loving. Thank you for dying for my sins, being buried and rising again and being alive and offering to reconcile me right now. Jesus, pray this right now. Jesus, save me. Be my Lord, my leader. If you prayed that, it's the most important moment of your life. Everything has changed. What does God call you to do next? Be baptized. That's what God designed. It's a, it's a celebration, a public display of what God has done inside of your soul right now. Lord, I pray to move among every person. May the Holy Spirit move Christians to deeper surrender and love and joy in the gospel and move people that need to be baptized to get up and come and be baptized to show the world what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen.